Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Buffalo. You are all welcome to our virtual service today. If this is your first time with us or our 25th time with us, we welcome you. From far and near, we all welcome you to share a space of worship. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Julie Taylor, and I am a worship associate at the church. Charlene Montgomery, another worship associate, will be sharing worship responsibilities with, the, with me this morning. And we have two guest speakers today. I am so pleased to introduce Courtney Anderson and Thea Hassan. Courtney is a mom to 10-month-old baby girl, Ryan. She's an entrepreneur and a college student studying media production. She's an active member of her church's youth department and loves interacting with and mentoring young people. With her brand, Young and Ambitious, she uses her voice to encourage, promote, and support young people doing positive things. We also welcome Thea Hassan. Thea Hassan is a recent member of the UU Church. Originally from Ithaca, she moved to Buffalo almost 10 years ago and loves to explore the region to find new places like the Grape Discovery Center on Lake Erie she went to last weekend. When not biking, paddling, or on an adventure, you will find her working as the communication director for Go Bike Buffalo. In addition to me and Charlene and Courtney and Thea, we have a great cast of characters helping us each week. Special thanks goes to Josh Disick and John Petroselli, Karen Streach, Bobby Witherow, and all our music staff, Jesse and Michael and Helen and Steve and Matthew and Daniel and Jonathan and all the other musicians and support who enrich our worship together every Sunday. And a very special thanks goes out to the Reverend Joan Montagnus, who has braved the world of Zoom worship and enabled all of us to still be together with, our, with social distancing. Next week, we will begin our regular worship schedule, and we look forward to Joan's return to the Zoom pulpit next Sunday. First, a couple of Zoom worship things. We can't see or hear you. You can't see or hear each other. You can still hear me and Charlene and the speakers. You can chat all through the service and after service during a virtual fellowship hour. Note, when you use the chat, make sure you're addressing not only the panelists, but also the attendees. We do have a couple of announcements today. Do you read your weekly e-blast? Because it's probably a good idea to do that. Did you know that today, today, September 6th, from 3 to 4 p.m., our Turkish neighbors would like to distribute sealed cups of Asher, or Noah's pudding, to members and friends of our congregation. It commemorates the landing of Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. They give it away to friends and colleagues regardless of religion and belief. And it's happening today from 3 to 4 at the UU Church. Reverend Joan will be happy to welcome you at the garden entrance at 695 Elmwood Avenue if, you know, maybe you've forgotten because you haven't been there for a while um, and as you receive your gift. What a yummy way to build bridges across cultures. And shout out for next week. Next week is in gathering. To celebrate a communion of experience, send in one word that lifts up your spirit. Send that word to Karen Streach at kstreach100 at gmail.com. That'll end up in your chat window. You need to do that by September 9th. And I'm just going to let you know, that's Wednesday. That's coming up really quickly. So get your inspirational word, one word, I know you're, you use, one word by Wednesday, September 9th to Karen Streach. And not only is next week in gathering, but ha, we will be observing the ordination of the Reverend Christina Church, 
mark your calendars for next week. It will be a hoot. And you know what? The fun doesn't stop there. After service next week, we will start virtual fellowship hours by using a separate meeting through Zoom rooms where you can meet with six to eight other members and friends of the congregation. The Zoom link will be on the exit slide on the eBless, but that's next week. Isn't next week really exciting? Gotta come, gotta be there next week. It's in gathering, it's a super special day. So we have lots of activities going on through the week and on Zoom platforms. Check out the newsletter and the eBlast. If you wanna receive a copy of the newsletter, please contact the church office. That's it for our announcements today. Now, let us worship. Worship today with your whole self. Worship today with your eyes, ears, hands, whatever you bring. Worship today as you sip tea or fold laundry. Worship today with your whole self. Come into this space of love. Come into this space of beams of information traveling at the speed of light. Traveling to where you are, wherever you are, whoever you are today and whoever you will become tomorrow. Come into this sacred space of worship to be blessed, to be enlightened, to be loved. Welcome to you, your whole self. Let us worship. To mark this as a sacred space, we use a chalice to um, light a chalice to indicate that we are um, setting this time aside as special time. And if you could please read the um, chalice lighting on the screen. We gather in loving community, inspiring one another to transform ourselves to create a more just and compassionate world. Now let us sing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. story for all ages is called The Kissing Hand. It's a book by Audrey Penn and I have read this book over and over to my children and it's even then when they're in their 20s they still ask for their kissing hands. Let's listen. Chester Raccoon stood at the edge of the forest and cried. 
I don't want to go to school, he told his mother. I want to stay home with you. I want to play with my friends and play with my toys and, and read my books and swing on my swing. Please, may I stay home with you? Mrs. Raccoon took Chester by the hand and nuzzled him on the ear. Sometimes we all have to do things we don't want to do, she told him gently, even if they seem strange and scary at first, but you will love school once you start. You'll make new friends and you'll play with new toys, read new books and swing on new swings. Besides, she added, I know a wonderful secret that will make your nights at school seem as warm and cozy as your days at home. Chester wiped away his tears and looked interested. A secret? What kind of secret? A very old secret, said Mrs. Raccoon. I learned it from my mother and she learned it from hers. It's called the kissing hand. The kissing hand, asked Chester. What's that? I'll show you. Mrs. Raccoon took Chester's left hand and spread open his tiny fingers into a fan. Leaning forward, she kissed Chester right in the middle of his palm. Chester felt his mother's kiss rush from his hand, up his arm, and into his heart. Even his silky black mask tingled with a special warmth. Mrs. Raccoon smiled. Now, she told Chester, whenever you feel lonely, just press your hand to your cheek and think, Mommy loves you. Mommy loves you. And that very kiss will jump to your face and fill you with toasty, warm thoughts. She took Chester's hand and carefully wrapped his fingers around the kiss. Now, do be careful not to lose it, she teased him. But don't worry. When you open your hand and wash your food, I promise the kiss will stick. Chester loved his kissing hand. Now he knew his mother's love would go with him wherever he went, even to school. That night, Chester stood in front of his school and looked thoughtful. Suddenly, he turned to his mother and grinned. Give me your hand, he told her. Chester took his mother's hand in his own and unfolded her large, familiar fingers into a fan. Next, he leaned forward and kissed the center of her hand. Now you have a kissing hand too, he told her. And with a gentle goodbye and I love you, Chester turned and danced away. Mrs. Raccoon watched Chester scamper across a tree limb and enter school. As the hoot owl rang in the new school year, she pressed her left hand to her cheek and smiled. The warmth of Chester's kiss filled her heart with special words. Chester loves you, it sang. Chester loves you. Every week, our congregation takes a good portion of our Sunday morning offering and gives it away to a social justice cause outside our church walls. September's Share the Plate recipient is Voice Buffalo. Voice Buffalo is an interfaith social justice organization made up of over 40 congregations and community-based organizations in Buffalo and Erie County. Today, we are honored to have Reverend Denise Walden share with us what Voice Buffalo stands up for. Good morning. My name is Reverend Denise Walden. I'm the faith leader and live free organizer at Voice Buffalo. I'm honored and humbled to be here this morning to talk to you about the work that we do at Voice Buffalo. But before I do, I have a question. And that question is how long? 
How long do we choose to be a people that turn a blind eye to the needs of others? How long do we choose to ignore that there are communities of people that have a lack of access to resources, healthcare, education, the things that will equip them to being the members of this community that are thriving? How long will we pretend that systemic oppression is not a thing? How long will we know that there are children that go to bed every night hungry and yet we expect them to come to school and fully show up and be present and academically achieve? How long will we ignore the outcries of people due to drug addiction and violence in their communities? How long? If you ask us at voice, we will tell you it's already been too long. Today, we're asking you to partner with us in your Share the Plate offering because we want to continue to do the work that will educate, equip, and empower people to thrive and be part of their own liberation. We want to ensure not equal, but equitable access to the things that are needed. We want to make sure that communities are equipped with restorative practices so that they can resolve their own conflict and make decisions that will impact them. We want to engage new voters, letting them know that their voices are not just heard, but they are needed and valuable. We want to reconstruct our public safety narrative, our policing, so that black and brown people aren't being hurt or murdered for standing up for themselves. We want to do the work that truly creates beloved community and we've been doing that work for a long time now we're hoping that you will partner with us in the work that we're doing and get to know more about what we do we thank you so much for hearing me today and we hope that you have a blessed and wonderful day be well you can make your offering by paypal by going to our website, www.buffalouuu.org and clicking on the blue donate button. Or you can send a check by mail to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Buffalo, 695 Elmwood Ave, Buffalo, New York, 14222. If yours is a gift to our Share the Plate ministry, please write share on the memo line and it will be shared between Voice Buffalo and the church operating budget. If yours is a welcome gift to our congregation, please write Pledge 2020 on the memo line. Either way, please write UUCB on the important line and we will do the bookkeeping. Let's give from our hearts so we can transform the world. first reading is a reading called A Pledge to Rescue Our Youth by Maya Angelou. Young women, young men of color, 
We add our voices to the voices of your ancestors who speak to you over ancient seas and across impossible mountaintops. Come up from the gloom of national neglect. You have already been paid for. Come out of the shadow of irrational prejudice. You owe no racial debt to history. The blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought you a future, free from shame and bright beyond the telling of it. We pledge ourselves and our resources to seek for you clean and well-furnished schools, safe and non-threatening streets, employment which makes use of your talents but does not degrade your dignity. You are the best we have. You are all we have. You are what we have become. We pledge you our whole hearts from this day forward. Good morning, everybody. Um, today, I just wanna share a few words. Uh, it's based on a conversation that I had with my uncle a few weeks ago, um, but it also um, was the first thing that kind of came to my mind when I was asked to speak with you all today. Um, so a few weeks ago when I was having this conversation, I was right around the time when the first set of protests and riots had started. And he asked me a question that kind of shocked me. He asked, do you think that this is setting us back? And he meant the protests. Um, and then he was, as us, he was talking about, you know, people of color. To which my response was, absolutely not. These protests and riots are responses to the hurt and pain that people are feeling. Then he said, well, it's making us look bad. To which again, I said, absolutely not. See, my uncle is in his late 50s. He's an army vet and he never went to college and he's worked his entire life. Um, he is one of those people that feel like millennials are lazy and entitled. Um, but that's because he doesn't come across very many millennials other than myself and my younger brother. He doesn't experience, has no experience working or talking with them. Um, when he looks at the Black Lives Matter movement, he doesn't pay attention to the hard work and effort that young people are putting in to get the correct message out. See, the message behind Black Lives Matter is to see us and to respect us just as you would respect yourself, um, to stand up and to fight for equality. That's what it's about. But that may not be what you get from the movement because some of us have not taken the time out to find out about the movement. And that doesn't just go for the Black Lives Matter movement, but that goes for a lot of what goes on around the world. We don't know because we don't take the time out to know. We don't take the time out to get to know one another or the person even standing next to us. We like to stay in our own little bubble and we don't like to experience other things. Um, I've always kind of considered myself to be a leader. I've been told that my entire life and eventually it stuck. And I'm one who likes to inspire my generation. Um, I created a brand called Young and Ambitious, which is all about promoting and supporting young people doing positive things. And with that, one of my favorite Bible verses and something that I live by is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12. It says, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Um, and that's from the New Living Translation version. Um, as a young person, I say, don't stop what you are doing. Continue to be a living and loving example. Continue to pave the way and, and leave your mark on this world. Young people will be the next leaders and you have to trust and believe in them. The brand that I created is all about believing in the power of the youth. Young people today are changing the world and continue to pave the way for the future. Not just in their thoughts, but also in their actions. There are young people out here that are leading this movement who have created brands, who have created responses to the negativity going around, but who have also just created positive outlets for a way of escape to get away from the busyness of the world. But it's so important that we continue to support them and believe in what they are doing. Because you see, when you believe in someone, not only do you give them hope, but you also are inspiring them to do better and to grow in their work. 
Today, I would like to give you all a call to action, to believe in the young people around you. Take the time to get to know them and allow them to pour into you. But at the same time, listen to the struggles that they experience and pour life back into them. We can all learn from one another, no matter what our age is, no matter what our differences. And just simply believing in the next person does wonders for one's confidence. I know for me personally that I would not be where I am without the constant belief and support from my parents. But also believing that this world will come together one day and we can all live in love. Belief creates vision. Belief creates strength of will. Belief creates resilience. And belief ignites and creates activities. Belief is an essential, is an essential ingredient in success. And you have to believe that you are better than you think you are. If you don't take anything away from my message to you today, I hope that you did hear me when I said I am a to be a living example and a loving example of God's love and to believe in the youth of today, but to also believe in yourself. Believe that you can create the change that you wish to see. Believe that we will be able to live in love. You need to believe in yourself just as you need to believe in others. They need it and they support and the support that you give others goes a long way. This is my call to action to you today. Now let us join together in a moment of prayer, meditation, and reflection. Spirit of life and love, we continue in this time of uncertainty, entering into a new stage of the journey. Some are going to school, some are learning at home. Some are falling ill. Some are falling at the shots of incomprehensible hatred and violence. Spirit of life and love, as we enter this new season, we reach our hands out to each other for support, for love, for the imagined touch of a loved one holding our hands, spreading our fingers, and hearing the precious words we yearn for. You are loved. You are blessed. You are not alone. I'd like to say a personal prayer for a former coworker and friend whom I've never met. This week, after a long journey filled with love and support from his family and friends, he completed his top surgery. Many, many positive thoughts go out to him and all those who supported him from Buffalo to North Carolina. Our prayers go out to you. Today also, our love and prayers go out to Georgia Pooley, who broke her femur a couple of weeks ago. She's in rehab at Beechwood Wesley Rehabilitation Center. She dearly needs our encouragement to work hard at PT so she is able to wear bear weight on her legs and then come home. Cards would be so appreciated and information can be seen in the chat window. And now let us fill the chat, fill our homes, fill our hearts with the names of all our loved ones suffering in sorrow and celebrating in joy. Each name a breath, each breath a prayer.
prayer renews us. Prayer centers our spirits to embrace the power of love, the power of belief, the power of starting a new day. The breath of nature is upon us. The spirit of life is within us. The community of love is among us. So be it, blessed be, and let the church say in the spirit of compassion, Amen. Our second reading today is called No Voyage by Mary Oliver. I wake earlier now that the birds have come and sing in the unfailing trees. On a cot by an open window, I lie like land used up while spring unfolds. Now of all voyages, voyagers, I remember who among them did not board ship with grief among their maps, till it seemed men never go somewhere, they only leave, wherever they are when the dying begins. For myself, I find my wanting life implores no novelty and no disguise of distance, where in what country might I put down these thoughts? Who still am citizen of this fallen city? On a cot by an open window, I lie and remember, while the birds in the trees sing of the circle of time. Let the dying go on, and let me, if I can, inherit from disaster before I move. Oh, I go to see the great ships ride from harbor, and my wounds leap with impatience, yet I turn back to sort the weeping ruins of my house. Here or nowhere, I will make peace with the fact. As a young girl in the first grade, I remember cutting out three little boats, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria in celebration of Christopher Columbus's heroic founding of America in 1492. As I cut the boats out of the paper stencil, I clipped my finger and began to cry. As an adult, I've learned Columbus did not find America at all. He never even set foot here. But his journey ignited the theft and colonization of what we now call our country. And like others who would follow him, Columbus capitalized on the sharing economy and kindness practiced by the indigenous people of what we now call Cuba, to steal their gold, steal their land, and enslave and murder the indigenous people along the way. I also realized as an adult, my tears that day were not just for my fingers, but due to a sadness I carried. My single parent alcoholic home was difficult to navigate as a six-year-old. Later in ninth grade American history class, I learned about the famous American inventor, Eli Whitney, the great creator of the cotton gin, a key catalyst of the industrial age that resulted in the thriving economy of antebellum South. The same year, 9-11 occurred. And I remember my history teacher sneering at my sister, did your people do this? Our grandfather is a Syrian immigrant. And my sister wept. As an adult, I now know Whitney's invention not only depended on, but invigorate, reinvigorated slave labor to allow cotton to be profitable for America. Our great American economy was not built on old-fashioned American ingenuity, but the labor of millions of enslaved people on forced labor camps, which we politely call plantations, as New York Times writer Nicole Hannah-Jones pointed out. Finally, when I was taught the Civil War, I was told the brave, forward-thinking North saved the evil, backward South from the cruelty and staining legacy of slavery. And around this same time, puberty hit. And well, before I could slide through the world invisibly, now I was an object to be commented on by the male passerby. Excuse me, sir, do you have the time? I asked the mall security guard. Baby, I got all day, he laughed at me. I didn't understand. And in fact, the North entered into a civil war with the South, not to emancipate slave people, but to keep the South from leaving the Union because they needed their money. And our great American president, Abraham Lincoln, author of the Emancipation Proclamation, never intended to give black people equal rights. Instead, he hatched a scheme to ship freed black people back to another country following the emancip their emancipation, 243 years after their ancestors had first arrived. 
He even went so far as to secure financing from Congress and appointed a commissioner of emigration to assist in the deployment. My history books failed to mention this. And when presenting the scheme to black abolitionists, but Lincoln explained, you and I are different races. Your race suffer very grateful, great, greatly, many of them, by living among us. While well, ours suffer from your presence. In a word, we suffer on each side. The depths of my ignorance frightened me. I am terrified to look at how much I don't know about the harm and the trauma I have inherited and subsequently passed to others by blindly picking up a bundle passed down to me and never pausing to unwrap the package to see what it contained. And as my teachers presented a version of American history that seemed to gloss over and omit the messy bits, I continued to struggle. With two alcoholic parents, my dysfunctional upbringing shared many commonalities with my formal and informal education. I was taught, don't acknowledge the dysfunction, don't acknowledge the pain, don't look at the ugly stuff, sweep everything under the rug, and when that rug fills up, buy a new rug. Don't ask too many questions, and when things start to get scary, dissociate. Of course, this is not sustainable. The more you keep shoving in the closet, the more the closet starts to overflow. A couple of years ago, I packed my trauma closet too full, and everything in there fell out onto the floor. The bundle I had been carrying for so long had finally unraveled. And now I have to clean up the mess once and for all. I have to pick up each object and I have to look at it. I have to examine my beliefs and ask myself where they came from. Is this real? Is it valid? I have to acknowledge and accept how much of those, each of those objects I've been carrying for decades have caused pain to me and to others. And I must forgive myself and apologize to those I've hurt in order to finally get rid of it. So how do we make America great once and for all? <laughs> we too have to unwrap our bundle, pass down to us under the label of edification and socialization and take out all the contents. We have to put them down, take a look at each object and see if it has a place in the world and the country we dream of and see how much pain these objects have caused to us and to others. We have to apologize collectively and individually to those we have hurt. It is not easy work. No one can do it for us. We can write policies, we can pass laws, vote in, elect, in elected leaders to encourage change, but it's up to each of us individually to make America great at last. Let's sing. Let's sing hymn number 205, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that says
let us join now in our words for extinguishing the chalice. As we extinguish the flame of this chalice, may we carry its light with us into the world in the power of peace, faith, justice, and love. We are a people of renewal. We are a people who can see the complex world for what it is and what it can become. We are a people of belief. We are a people of love. Remember that you are blessed. Remember that you are a blessing. And above all else, know that you are not alone. You are never alone. So be it. Blessed be. And let the church say, Amen.